our presentation to be both interesting and entertaining, uh, as much as copyright and trademark law can be entertaining. Um, this is Innovation Nation. We thank all of you who've returned uh, from Innovation Nation uh, 1.0 to Innovation Nation 2.0. Uh, ironically, Innovation Nation 1.0 was uh, canceled due to innovation technology problems. So we can laugh at ourselves and hopefully you'll laugh with us. Uh, my name is Alan Nemus. I'm a partner here at the Hush Blackwell uh, Intellectual Property Group and I uh, manage domestic and international trade bar, copyright, uh, and related intellectual property matters for uh, clients, big and small. Uh, I've been doing this for about 35 years. Stunning for a guy who looks so young, but what can you do? Uh, before we get started, we want to have a few housekeeping matters uh, we need to go over. First of all, you already know where the bathrooms are. That's the joy of having something remote. In addition to that, uh, at the bottom of your audience console, you're going to find uh, application icons for your use today. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit via the question box. We'll try to answer all the questions during the webcast, but uh, if we don't get to it uh, because I'm talking too long uh, or Don, my co-speaker, is talking too long, we can always get back to you later, but we'll try our best. You'll see a PDF of the presentation available in the resource folder. And as far as CLE, for those of you who need CLE, uh, if you click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen, there'll be a certificate of attendance, uh, including course numbers, which we'll mail to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast uh, for watching and sharing with your family and friends and pets. Toward the end of the program, be sure to complete the short survey. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback uh, to plan future programs. And if you don't like my jokes, keep that to yourself. Uh, these are all the housekeeping items. Let's get started with the program. First of all, uh, the speakers today joining me is uh, my colleague, Don Erickson. Don uh, has ex significant experience in managing domestic international trademark portfolios, although I'm gonna talk about trademarks, uh, but he also deals with very complex copyright issues. So we're gonna do a two for uh, trademarks and copyrights. For those of you that are interested in patents, come back for another seminar later uh, with our engineers. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started now that you're laughing your sides off. Um, here's an overview, oh, too fast. We have an overview, uh, our, uh, well, we're uh, trademark legislation, cases, legislation, and copyright. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about in the next uh, the next hour. Uh, and here is a quick view of the cases that, well, that's, that we skipped, them. whatever. Um, trademark legislation, big, big news. The uh, trademark, uh, there's Trademark Modernization Act that was passed uh, at the end of last year. It was tucked into the uh, Appropriations Act I tried to print it out. Uh, I didn't realize I was printing out the entire Appropriations Act, and it's about a thousand pages, so I broke the uh, printer. But what you need to know for your purposes, in addition to the fact that the government's spending a lot of money, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon your point of view, but from a trademark perspective, what you want to know is that there are two new ex parte proceedings that hopefully will save you a lot of money. Uh, because instead of having to file a cancellation action against someone that you may suspect may not be using the mark, you now have a streamlined procedure for expungement or reexamination. Uh, I had a case uh, several years ago where we suspected the other side was fraudulently uh, claiming registration and that it never actually used the mark, but uh, tens of thousands of dollars into it uh, before we could prove that the other side uh, had not uh, used its mark. Now, like many other countries around the world, we will have a streamlined uh, administrative procedure for expungement. Uh, you can either file um, for an expungement proceeding, which means that you claim that the other side has never used the mark in commerce. You can file that within three to 10 years after registration, or there's a reexamination for marks that claimed uh, use initially, like uh, under 1A, actual use, 
uh, but you suspect that they didn't begin using until after they claimed that they'd used either when they filed or when they filed their statement of use. Now, these things will cost you about $600 per class as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars in a cancellation action. So good news for uh, trademark, uh, trademark plaintiffs if they're trying to clear the deadwood uh, out of the uh, register. Uh, now, in many other countries, what happens is these expungement proceedings are used as kind of a defensive tactic. So someone threatens you with uh, uh, some kind of infringement, the first thing you do is file an expungement proceeding and tie them up in the trademark office uh, for uh, many months or years. So this could be abused, but I think uh, the good news is that uh, in fact, this will help to clear Deadwood and to make it a lot cheaper and easier for you to uh, be able to uh, clear the Deadwood and get your registrations uh, on the register. Typically what happens is you have European or Asian or other foreign or applicants who will file for the kitchen sink, uh, even though they don't uh, really use it on all those goods. But uh, since they don't have to prove use when they file, uh, they can file for everything. And then you come along and want to uh, file for one thing because you're a US applicant, but you find out that you're being stopped by someone who has 40 things in your class. So now you would be able to do a surgical strike and seek an expungement uh, or a reexamination with respect to just those goods that are blocking your own application. So that's, I think, the most important thing and probably the biggest news with respect to the new law. Um, other, uh, other portions of the law that are important is uh, the office action response is going to go from six months to three months. And if you want an extension, you're going to have to pay for it. So hopefully that will uh, quicken the response time in the trademark office, although uh, given how far behind the trademark office is right now in terms of response dates, I'm not sure it's going to make much of a difference. Um, the other big, big news is that the law uh, reverses the uh, eBay versus Merck Exchange case in which uh, these, uh, the court had indicated that in order that the, their, uh, the uh, the issue of irreparable harm had to be proved and was on the burden of the plaintiff. Uh, that switched what was normally the case in the past, which was if you could prove your case of infringement, then the court would simply uh, presume that there had been irreparable harm if you're trying to get a preliminary or permanent injunction. So the Trademark Modernization Act restores the original or uh, pre-eBay uh, standard so that if you have a good case and you can demonstrate a likelihood of succeeding on the merits, uh, the court will presume that uh, you have irreparable harm and then the other side has the burden to prove that uh, you're wrong. So that's the legislation, big news, and uh, I think it will be important change in terms of how uh, we deal with trademarks in the trademark office. Uh, here are the trademark cases. So now we're going to talk about cases now that we're done with legislation. First thing, you've probably heard this a couple times. We talked about it on several occasions. The Romag case uh, is a 9-0 uh, Supreme Court decision that resolves the split in the circuits as to whether or not uh, a finding of willful infringement is required before awarding profits in the trademark infringement case. Uh, the, the, the circuits were split. And uh, in a 9-0 decision, uh, the court held that uh, willful infringement is not a prerequisite uh, in terms of trademark infringement cases in order to get uh, damages and profits, but it is still an important uh, factor. So while it is not uh, a lock on the door, you still uh, will probably want to uh, include evidence of intent uh, and willfulness when trying to get the court to award damages. So it's good news for plaintiffs in that it may be easier to uh, obtain uh, obtain damages in the trademark case, uh, making it easier than it has been in the past. Booking.com, I could spend an hour on booking.com. You've probably uh, seen a lot about this, uh, this particular decision. Um, I think that it was wrongly decided, but the Supreme Court 
uh, didn't ask me for my opinion when it ruled. Uh, this was uh, the very well-known Booking.com hotel reservation and travel service company filed for Booking.com uh, as a trademark uh, for those services. Um, the USPTO, I think rightly said that when you have a generic term like booking, a booking site, which is equivalent to a travel site or a hotel uh, reservation site, and you add on .com, which is simply an address for where it exists on the internet, that uh, when you put those two together, uh, you don't have uh, a descriptive or inherently dis distinctive mark. It is and always will be generic. Well, um, the Fourth Circuit, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Eastern District of Virginia and the Fourth Circuit and even the Supreme Court disagreed, basically saying that uh, people don't ask for a, a booking.com and uh, the uh, other reservation, you know, hotels.com doesn't say uh, I, uh, I'm a booking.com site. They might say I'm a booking site or they may say I'm a travel site, but they do not say I'm a booking.com site. So the court said since that term uh, combined is not a generic term, uh, that it is probably descriptive uh, and can acquire secondary meaning. Now the court, and actually all three of the courts that looked at this, relied very heavily on survey evidence, uh, which was uh, a Teflon case that tried to look at whether consumers believe booking.com was a common name like a uh, grocery store, or whether it was uh, a brand name. And surprisingly, 75% of those that were surveyed thought that Booking.com was a brand name and not a common name. Now, the same people also thought that WashingMachine.com, one out of three people believed that was a brand. So I think uh, what happened in this case, from my perspective, is that uh, the court uh, uh, mistook or confused uh, de facto, I guess, secondary meaning, the fact that many people uh, had uh, come across Booking.com, and so they knew about that uh, website and knew about that name, and so they considered it to be a brand name, even though Booking itself should never be uh, used by one party since it is, in fact, generic. So um, I think that uh, we have a situation where the court got it wrong, but uh, that's uh, probably water under the bridge unless Congress decides to act. So other than me grumping and grouching about how uh, bad this is for commerce and how uh, mistaken the courts are, uh, what's the takeaway? I think the takeaway is if you can snatch yourself a highly descriptive or generic term uh, with a top level uh, a domain such as .com or .biz or .net, uh, you've got some very very valuable intellectual property. So I guess my recommendation would be until Congress dis, uh, changes its mind is grab the grocery store.com, uh, grab the, uh, uh, the sports.com. And uh, then I, I guess what's going to come next is that uh, booking.com, even though I promised that it wouldn't, is going to go after ebooking.com and it's going to go after booking.net and booking.biz. I think that's really bad for commerce um, and uh, bad for trademark law, but I think that's what's going to happen. So if you uh, if you can snatch a uh, a win and get a, a generic term with a, a TLD, uh, you have done a great service for your company. And uh, I, according to the Supreme Court, uh, that is uh, most likely going to be uh, considered descriptive. And if you can demonstrate secondary meaning you will have a very, very piece of real estate. In the same vein, um, uh, Sarah Lee uh, filed for Artisano uh, for, uh, yes, yes, Artisan Bread. Um, they claimed that Artisano was, uh, was uh, either descriptive or inherently distinctive and that people would not, uh, they would not uh, translate the term Artisano from Spanish into artisan as in English. Uh, the, the, the trademark channel appeal board, excuse me, um, disagreed and said that artisano equals artisan. Artisan is generic for bread, um, and therefore uh, it is uh, not registrable. 
However, in the alternative, uh, knowing that the uh, that Sarah Lee people would probably appeal, in the alternative, they said that it was a descriptive mark or potentially descriptive mark, which I know seems a little confusing and contradictory, but uh, there you have it. Um, when they did the uh, review of the descriptiveness, there was also here another survey done by another very clever survey expert uh, who found that a significant number of uh, people under a Teflon test showed that 55% uh, uh, of the respondents identified Artisano as a brand name. So again, I think the courts are confusing a de facto secondary meaning, the fact that Sara Lee sells uh, you know, millions of, uh, of these types of breads, such that people are uh, familiar with the name and confusing that with uh, whether or not it is a brand or a generic term. Likewise, in bookings.com, bookings.com showed that they had had 1.4 billion impressions in one year. So I think we have an issue where the courts are uh, confusing uh, the genericness, uh, Teflon surveys, and, and de facto secondary meaning. But again, um, if Sarah Lee, this is, on, uh, this is on appeal now, if they can demonstrate uh, that uh, through their survey that uh, people consider this to be a brand name and not uh, a generic term, uh, we have another situation where generics, uh, at least a foreign equivalent of generics, may be able to sneak through and they may, may be able to uh, obtain registration. So again, the takeaway is if you're clever enough and you advertise enough, uh, you may be able to get generic terms, at least in a foreign equivalency, uh, past the registration at the USPTO. And if somebody wanted to have artesino bread, they could be stopped by artesano. So uh, these are probably good times for uh, trademark lawyers because there's going to be a lot of litigation on these issues. And as I say, uh, for, uh, for companies, um, I think you can be more aggressive in terms of uh, what you think you can protect uh, in the trademark office. Um, the next case is a, uh, a kind of a warning uh, and it's kind of surprising that this would happen to Nike. But uh, if you look at uh, this uh, advertising presentation by Nike, Nike had uh, a, a multi-million dollar advertising campaign for Sports Changes Everything. It was videos and print ads and billboards, and it was going to culminate in the 2020, uh, uh, I think the, uh, either the World Series or, uh, uh, or uh, I'm not exactly sure what it was going to culminate with, but it was uh, it was going to uh, it was going to be uh, a big big uh, advertising campaign. Oh, actually, it was going to be the Super Bowl. Um, I'm not that good at sports. Sorry, Super Bowl, World Series, whatever. Anyway, um, what uh, what what they didn't uh, calculate, or at least what they didn't, maybe they ignored was that uh, there was a, another company that uh, had registrations for running changes everything and uh, not only running changes everything, but change everything for uh, running stores. Uh, and in fact, to make things even worse for Nike, uh, this company was a very large customer of Nike uh, and bought a lot of Nike products. Now, Nike made the rather uh, interesting argument that um, the uh, use of sports changes everything was simply an advertising slogan. It was not uh, a trademark. It had no source uh, identification. Uh, it was not a source identifier, so it could not be a trademark, and therefore there could be no uh, infringement. A very interesting argument, and I'm actually think that Nike maybe blushed when it made that argument in court, because as you see, the sport changes everything was used in very, very close association with uh, the Nike swoosh. So uh, I guess the lawyers had to argue something. Either they didn't do a search of their slogan, 
or the marketing people didn't tell the, uh, the legal department that they were doing this, which is pretty surprising. But uh, in the end, I think the takeaway is any any advertising slogan, any uh, promotion uh, can have trademark significance and can cause you uh, to have an infringement claim brought against you. In this particular case, uh, Fleet Feet uh, filed for a preliminary injunction and got one and stopped Nike in its tracks so that its advertisement the Super Bowl was never aired and they had to actually uh, they had to can the entire advertising campaign. So um, many millions of dollars later, um, I think the takeaway there is uh, do your uh, uh, do your due diligence, and whenever you have an advertising campaign uh, or an advertising slogan, you should run it uh, through your uh, uh, your normal traps and uh, and get it cleared. Uh, our job here is to scare you to death, so I hope we're doing that. Uh, in, in providing you with these cases. Um, the next case uh, has to do with uh, trade dress. Uh, this was a case in which uh, a company had a multicolored kind of rainbow orange to red packaging, um, and it tried to obtain a registration just for the packaging, uh, just the coloration. The trademark uh, office said, uh, you, uh, you can't register that color has to be uh, is always um, descriptive and you have to prove secondary meaning in order to obtain a trade dress registration for that packaging and the TTAB affirmed uh, the federal circuit reversed and said wait a minute the supreme court has said that uh, the three-dimensional a uh, product configuration uh, trade dress that is always inherently distinctive so it's the actual shape of the product uh, you always have to prove secondary meaning, but product packaging in and of itself, like you know the the colors on the package, uh, can be inherently distinctive. Um, and uh, so they sent it back to the uh, uh, to the TTAB. The TTAB sent it back to the off, uh, to the uh, office action of the examining attorney, and the examining attorney said, uh, "Yeah, we're wrong. Uh, in fact, this could be uh, inherently distinctive." But this one isn't. Um, and what they needed to look at to determine whether or not the trade dress was distinctive was the Seabrook test. The Seabrook test uh, basically saying, is it new? Is it eye arresting? Is it different from uh, others in the same uh, industry? And can it uh, serve as a source indicator uh, separate and apart from any trademark with words uh, on the packaging? Um, we'll never find out because uh, they dropped the application. But again, I think the takeaway here is uh, if you're going to try to register uh, coloration on your packaging, um, first of all, you should make it eye arresting. You should make it different from your competitors um, and it should stand out from the words. Uh, typically what I recommend to clients is start with the entire package, put the words on, uh, you know, put on any frilly designs and the color, and then kind of peel the onion back uh, and uh, first file for the kitchen sink in terms of the entire packaging, maybe then strip away a portion of the packaging, and then finally at the end, uh, file for the coloration of the packaging itself. So um, that's, uh, I think, the way to do it. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, Forney got tired or ran out of money. Uh, similarly, uh, there was a case decided involving uh, the, uh, a mix of uh, dental adhesive products that had um, uh, various colorations uh, on the tips. Uh, and uh, these different tips were uh, used by the company to uh, indicate different sizes for the various uh, uh, dental uh, adhesive products. So if you wanted one that was really small, maybe it was yellow. If you wanted one that was, uh, you know, uh, three millimeters, it was maybe red. Um, that one was actually registered. All of these got registered um, as uh, under Section 2F as having acquired secondary meaning. And then a, another competitor came along and used a similar system. They were sued by the uh, trademark registrant 
and uh, the Federal Circuit said that uh, since these were simply uh, indicators of size, they were functional, and thus uh, uh, they could not stand uh, and uh, were not could never serve as trade dress, being functional and not uh, distinctive. So uh, I think the takeaway here is if you're going to try and obtain trade dress, uh, don't use it as an equivalent for some functional uh, purpose. Also, uh, if you remember Pink Panther or uh, UPS, you know, Pink Panther has pink and it focuses on one color. Uh, UPS color uh, has focused on brown. So what you want to do is focus, uh, I think, on one color, not try to uh, obtain trade dress on a bunch of colors. Since then by doing so, I think you ruin your argument uh, that people associate that color exclusively with you. Uh, another trade dress case, Pocky, uh, the uh, chocolate, chocolate on a stick, uh, uh, candy confection company, uh, had a registration. They had uh, obtained secondary meaning registration under Section 2F for the shape of their, dare I say it, Pocky sticks. Uh, I can't hear laughter, so um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just have to trust you. Uh, quit rolling your eyes out there. Anyway, um, later on, a, a competitor uh, came along and uh, had a very similar uh, looking uh, confection stick with chocolate, chocolate on a stick. Uh, Pocky sued based on its registrations and longstanding use. Um, and uh, the Third Circuit said, no, uh, if you look at the advertising for Pocky, it says that it uh, makes it easy to eat. Um, you don't have to open your mouth wide to eat it. You can pack a lot of these Pockies within one box because they're so skinny. And you don't get chocolate on your hand because uh, of the way that it's shaped. So the court said those all indicate functionality. Um, and, uh, and thus, uh, they uh, rejected the registrations, said that they were functional and uh, the claim of infringement was uh, rejected. So the takeaway here, I think, is uh, while you, if you want to protect your trade dress, um, find a very uh, unusual irs shape, but you have to uh, limit your, uh, your marketing people because they're going to want to say uh, how great the shape is and uh, how it makes it easier, faster, cheaper. Uh, and better to use than your competitors' products. And as soon as you do that, at least under this uh, case, you may have uh, hoisted yourself on your own petard uh, and caused yourself to get a functionality ruling. Uh, well, remember Chewy Vuitton? Uh, there was another case recently in the, sec in the Ninth Circuit uh, where Jack Daniels went against Bud Spaniels uh, in a crazy, crazy case, uh, this, the Ninth Circuit said, yeah, I can't believe it, I blush making this uh, holding, that a chewy dog toy um, is an expressive product. It is uh, akin to a movie or a film or a, uh, uh, or a novel uh, because it's poking fun at an iconic brand. Uh, so uh, that raises the stakes. And then if you have a parity decision here, uh, you have to result to the Rogers standard, which is very difficult to prove uh, against a parity. Um, so I think uh, the pendulum is swinging in favor of First Amendment protection in these cases. Uh, but the, uh, the decisions are really in the eye of the beholder. So if you get a court that uh, thinks that this is a funny or poking fun or making some social commentary uh, against an iconic brand, they're going to uh, say that it's parody. Uh, that doesn't always happen. And I think uh, parodies are very, very hard to predict. Uh, we had, we went against the same uh, defendant uh, in a case for another iconic uh, alcoholic beverage brand uh, and were able to obtain uh, a preliminary injunction, but we did it in the Eighth Circuit. So uh, I would say stay out of the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit if you want to sue 
uh, people that uh, claim parity. Uh, those circuits apparently have a much greater sense of humor than the Eighth Circuit. Uh, I would say go with more uh, uh, with uh, judges that have uh, less of a sense of humor and more of a respect for trademark uh, rights. Uh, so uh, just to test before we, uh, we finish up here, uh, here is another case uh, where we're going to give you a poll uh, to ask you, uh, uh, there was a t-shirt company uh, that filed in the trademark office for conceal and carry and used uh, graphics that looked a lot like Coca-Cola's. So uh, you would think that maybe they would be able to <clears throat> uh, include a parity defense uh, and win as, uh, as the uh, Spaniels case did in the Second Circuit. Um, but uh, this is the TTAB and not the, uh, I'm sorry, not the Ninth Circuit. So question, here's a poll as to um, whether or not uh, you think that there was dilution by blurring in this case. Yes, no, or I don't know. We'll give you a minute or two to figure that out. Okay, well, for those of you who are still awake, we'll see what you said. Uh, dilution, I, we clearly have trademark activists here, um, and uh, 70 percent, almost as many people as thought that Booking.com was a brand, uh, believed that there was dilution by blurring, and in fact, uh, you are correct. Uh, the TTAB said, uh, that uh, they didn't make any social commentary. It was just free writing, free writing on the goodwill. I think that if uh, Conceal and Carry had had a better lawyer, uh, with all due respect to the lawyer that represented them, they could have made all kinds of claims that this was social commentary. What's more American than gun carrying and Coca-Cola? Um, so uh, I think that this could have gone the other way in the Ninth Circuit or the Second Circuit, but the TTAB said no go, no, no registration. Uh, very quickly, uh, in this case, uh, a company, a footwear and apparel company had filed for the mark clear. The trademark office said clear is descriptive um, and uh, rejected it under a 2E. Uh, and then uh, the uh, clever trademark attorney said, oh, well, we'll just exclude uh, anything that, uh, that has to do with clear products. Nothing clear is going to be on these products. And the trademark office said, aha, uh, now you've admitted that it is uh, deceptively misdescriptive. So um, I think be careful when you make uh, exclusions uh, or express uh, carve outs uh, because that can be used against you. Also, stay away from uh, marks that uh, have clear, excuse me, pun, uh, clear impact uh, in uh, your industry. So there are a lot of transparent uh, products, including. Uh, the uh, plaintiff, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, applicant in this particular uh, uh, this particular case was using the term clear for clear products. And finally, uh, this case just came out last week. Uh, very briefly, as you may all recall, years ago, the Medinol case uh, basically said that if you screw up and have a mistake uh, in your application, uh, and you, uh, you put the wrong uh, first use date, you put in too many uh, products that you didn't use, uh, uh, or uh, it's the wrong uh, party that filed it, that's all fraud. Uh, the bet and all was known or should have known standard. Uh, that was relaxed in the uh, In Ray Bose case in which the Federal Circuit said, no, no, there has to be uh, actual intent to deceive in order for there to be fraud. Well, last week, uh, the TTAB asked a question that was left open in In Re Bose, which is, does uh, uh, reckless disregard for the truth, uh, does that equate with fraud? And the answer is yes. Uh, in this particular case, the attorney who filed the Section 15 Declaration of Incontestability knew that there were actually uh, challenges and proceedings that were ongoing at the time of the claim. Uh, of uh, incontestability, but he wasn't aware 
that that was a problem in filing Section 15. So he did not have an actual intent to deceive, but the TTAB said he should have known that uh, because it was clear on the face of the instructions. And so now we're back to uh, a situation where it may be that if you simply blow it and screw up and it's obvious that you made a mistake, uh, that fraud can be claimed. So look for greater fraud claims going forward and uh, mind your P's and Q's, double check everything to make sure they're accurate when you're filing your applications and registrations. And if you find later on that you made a mistake, then you should definitely tell the trademark office as soon as you find out that was one of the other characteristics uh, and factors that the TTAB found in a finding of fraud. And that's it. Don, it's all yours. All right. Hello, everybody. I think we're switching the camera over to me, too, uh, but hopefully you can hear me. There we go. Hey there. So copyright legislation is up first, and we'll talk about some cases uh, in the same um, uh, bill that had to do with the trademark changes. There were also some copyright changes to the legislation, including the Copyright Alternative and Small Claims Enforcement Act, the CASE Act uh, that the Copyright Office had wanted to pass for a long time, which was uh, to grant a forum for people to bring small copyright claims. So the Copyright Office has now officially hired three judges for the Copyright Claims Board, and they're staffing that out. Um, and some of the features of the Copyright Claims Board are that the damages are capped at $30,000 for a whole case. One of the uh, pretty striking things about it to me was that plaintiffs can request $7,500 in statutory damages, even if the infringement occurred before the work was registered, which is different from any other civil case where, you know, if, if the infringement occurs, but there's no registration, even if you get a registration later, you still can't get statutory damages. That's not the case with these small uh, claims, which uh, could create potentially higher liability um, for for you all <laughs> if you're dealing with a case that's here. But you can opt out of uh, having a case before the Copyright Claims Board, and the Copyright Office is still working out exactly how that will work uh, in terms of some ability to opt out preemptively. But the important takeaway to know is that if you get a complaint filed against you, that you should not just ignore it, <laughs> that you should have somebody look at it and think about how to respond to it. Because if you don't opt out, you'll be in the case. <laughs> um, so that's, that's something important to know. It doesn't require a lawyer. Uh, it's a good opportunity for law students to get involved in representing parties on a pro bono basis. Um, and cases will be decided by a three judge panel unless it's a smaller claim and then one uh, court officer or judge could decide no case is precedential with respect to any other case. And you can appeal these uh, decisions, but the standard is is high. It's that you know administrative law, abuse of discretion type standard. And so that's, that's a tricky thing. Um, another thing to know about these small claims cases is that the applicants who are involved in bringing the cases can request to expedite registration of their works. You might remember a Supreme Court case from just a little while ago that you need to have a registration before, or you need to at least have filed and then get the registration before bringing your uh, case in, in federal court. That's sort of the case here. You can get it on file and then you have to get it and exp um, expedite the registration. So anyway, these, these cases will be available. The Copyright Office thinks by the end of the year, so stay posted for developments on that. Um, they're still working out the cost fees and procedure of bringing an action. So we're going to talk about some cases today. We'll run through these. Probably the biggest decision within the past year I'm sure you heard a lot of news about was uh, Google v. Oracle. And if your business doesn't have very much to do with software, then you probably ignored this. If your business does have to do with software, then you probably waited for this with bated breath. Uh, we'll see this case might have uh, limited applicability because the uh, decision basically said that it was limited to the facts of 
of the case. But things to know about it, a 7-2 decision, the court assumed without deciding that, uh, that, that it was copyrightable, that the APIs uh, were, the software code was copyrightable. And the decision then focused on whether Google's use of Oracle's APIs was fair use. So a big fair use decision um, uh, and fair use is popular. So that's always uh, fun to talk about. So in terms of how the court decided the fair use analysis, it was, uh, I would say, unorthodox to say the least, instead of starting with the the first out of the four fair use factors, the court started with the second factor, the nature of the copyrighted work, and uh, then went back to the first factor and concluded that Google's use was transformative because it used the code to develop smartphones instead of using the code on desktops or laptops, which is what Oracle used the code for. So query whether using software on a different type of device uh, makes that use transformative, but that's what the Supreme Court was saying in this case. And the third factor in terms of the amount of the use, the typical analysis is to look at how much of the original you have taken. Did you just take a paragraph of it? Did you take a sentence? How much of it did you take? Uh, but that's not what the court looked at here. They actually looked at how much of the code they didn't copy, which is again, not the usual analysis of fair use. Uh, and on the fourth factor, the court uh, typically looks at the potential effect on the market for the use. And here they just looked at the effect on the market. So uh, we'll see, you know, how lower courts uh, take this case. But um, but for now, that's that's the world that we're operating in in terms of the Supreme Court's uh, look at most recent look at fair use. We have another software related case we wanted to talk about, which was bit management software versus the US. This was basically basically a case about exceeding the scope of a license. There was a software company that licensed some 3D visualization software to the Navy. Uh, the Navy was tasked with managing the individual seat licenses. There was some back and forth about uh, how exactly they were going to do that, but it was the Navy's responsibility. and. Uh, the Navy then exceeded the scope of the license by not actually monitoring the number of simultaneous users and so exceeded the scope of the license by allowing too many people to use the software at the same time. So the Federal Circuit affirmed the Court of Claims holding that the Navy's copying was outside of the scope of its license uh, and that therefore it was copyright infringement. And that case is back down at the Court of Claims where they are fighting over damages and how much they will have to pay. So. Uh, for you folks who federal follow the federal circuit, you might be interested to know that Judge Newman concurred, but said that the copying of the program was also infringement. So separate in part from the uh, exceeding the scope of the license. Okay, next we have another poll question for you. Your poll will pop up in that little window just like last time. So the original here is on the left. That is the original photograph. And the question is whether the uses on the right are fair use and uh, whether that fair use defense to copyright in infringement applies. So I'll go ahead and advance that so you get the little question to pop up. And if you need to move the little box, you should still be able to, to look behind it and see the, see the images. So we'll give you a minute to, to answer that. See a few answers coming in. Okay. Here are your results. I think you knew the answer. I think we have some people here that have read these cases before, if I had to guess. Okay, so you said, no, it's not fair use. And that is, in fact, what the Second Circuit decided um, uh, as a matter of law. So originally, well, let's back up. So this case involves the photographer, uh, Ms. Goldsmith, who took the original photograph here. 
And through her agency, she had licensed use of the photograph to Vanity Fair magazine for use as an artist reference and to publish an illustration based on the photo back in 1984. So, but, and that permission also required attribution to Goldsmith. So uh, Goldsmith was not aware of much of what happened after that, but Vanity Fair commissioned Andy Warhol to create images based on that photographic reference. There was a, um, a, a use back in 1984 of one of the images, but, but Andy Warhol had actually created all the works that you see there, the 15 additional works. So after that, the Andy Warhol Foundation acquired the rights uh, in those works, sold the originals, and continued to license the rights and outside of what was allowed based on that original artist uh, reference. So uh, the foundation filed a declaratory judgment action for non-infringement. The Second Circuit said, yeah, that's fair use. And the Second Circuit said, no, that's not fair use. Actually, all four factors favor the photographer. So, you know, based on your poll results, you can see how these fair use decisions, you know, reasonable people can differ in terms of the outcome of those. But the thing to know about this case is that it's different from, uh, you might have seen the Seventh Circuit case involving the mayor's face on a t-shirt and sort of what was left behind. Um, but the big news item out of this is that there's no celebrity plagiarist privilege. Uh, it doesn't matter that people recognize the images as a Warhol. It was still an impermissible taking of the photographer's uh, original uh, work. So that's that case is still pending back down at the uh, Southern District. So also talking about New York cases, we've got a couple of these involving the Leibowitz uh, law firm. Um, who brings a lot of claims on behalf of plaintiffs. Generally, when people are using images that they found on the internet and posting them on their own web pages, and in this case, uh, uh, Mr. Leibowitz has been fined a significant amount of money for claiming that the photographs were registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. So uh, it seems that some people are fighting back against some of these claims that you may have experienced yourself or uh, may be... Uh, May, may encounter at some point. So just to know that you, you can fight back against the, the copyright plaintiffs if, if you happen to see one of these types of claims. And here's an example of one of those Murano versus Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is a non-precedential case though, and it has to do um, uh, with the, a museum's use of a photograph as part of their uh, website. And in this case, the court did find that it was fair use to use this photograph on the website. Uh, but I would direct you to the analysis at the bottom of that slide, where it says here, the district court appropriately conducted a fair use analysis that was deeply case specific. And by the way, that's so often the case with fair use. Unless you have a case that's dead on, it it's difficult to predict with certainty how it's going to turn out, but we have some of these guideposts to be able to help us. And so the court said a different use by a museum or art exhibition and combination of factors could have tipped the scales in the other direction. So it's just, it's so tricky to predict that something is fair use and it really uh, is a fact intensive analysis. Here's a case, uh, Corella versus Valley out of the Ninth Circuit. This has to do with the Four Seasons and the musical Jersey Boys, where uh, one of the rights owners essentially sued over the use of, um, uh, um, of the name and likeness and story in Jersey Boys. So basically what happened there is this idea of um, Copyright estoppel. So we've got this asserted truths doctrine where an, uh, an author who holds out their work as fact can't later claim that, no, that was actually made up and now you've infringed copyright. So if you're working on a documentary or you're working on something where you're trying to rely on factual information, facts are not copyrightable. Everyone should be able to use facts. This case is kind of knocking out those sort of false facts that are placed in there as saying, ha ha, now you copied my, my false fact. That's not gonna, courts are not gonna let that happen. So 
Um, I think that was that was also an interesting case. In the interest of time, we'll move on though to Unicolors. This one is uh, going to be heard before the Supreme Court. So you might have heard about this case with a textile design. Um, and this also has to do with registration of the copyrights in the textile design and uh, getting the Copyright Office involved. So the Central District of California had rejected a motion by H&M that, you know, without referring it to the Copyright Office, they were finding no intent to defraud the Copyright Office and there's no evidence of material error. The Ninth Circuit said, no, you have to consider known inaccuracies and refer it to the Copyright Office, Register of Copyrights, to kind of weigh in on the case. So the Supreme Court has granted certiorari to answer that question. Does the copyright law require a district court to request advice from the Copyright Office when there are questions about the validity of the copyright registration, but no evidence of fraud or material error? So that's still pending. If you want to listen in on the oral argument, that will be happening on November 8th. The Dr. Seuss case just wrapped up uh, yesterday. So you've got an update here you might have seen in your inboxes uh, if you subscribe to any news articles. The, the Southern District of California had said that the, oh, the places you'll boldly go, which are the images you see on the right side there, it's basically a mashup of Dr. Seuss and Star Trek uh, and sort of a play on the original Dr. Seuss book, which are the images you see there on the left, Oh, the Places You'll Go, the popular graduation gift book. Uh, the creators of the book on the right had argued that it was fair use to basically mash up Star Trek with Dr. Seuss, and therefore it was transformative, creating a new message, new meaning, all of those things that you talk about under the fair use analysis. Uh, but the Ninth Circuit said no, that the mashup was not a parody, it was not transformative, it was not fair use. So again, being very careful about how you look at claiming fair use. I think a lot of times people might say, oh yeah, I, I can do that because it's fair use. Well, it's, it's a very tricky analysis actually to look at and you gotta make sure you're looking at all the four factors to, to see you know where that might shake out, how a court might deal with that. Um, and so the Ninth Circuit had kicked that back down to the Southern District of California. And just yesterday, the parties filed a joint motion to approve uh, consent judgment and permit injunction. So that book, you will not see that book on the right on store shelves. They are not selling that. Um, but on the other hand, they're not moving forward with the case and uh, there won't be any damages. So that's uh, good news for them there. Got a few quick ones here. So Nicklin versus Sinclair Broadcast Group. This has to do with embedding photographs. There have been a lot of cases about embedding photographs versus linking. So linking to something is not copyright infringement, but more courts are finding that embedding an image, like embedding your actual, uh, you know, YouTube video or you know something on Twitter, can be copyright infringement, or at least here, the Southern District of New York has denied a motion to dismiss the copyright infringement claim, saying that it's not a display. So uh, the news here is that the uh, New York is going to do this a little different from California. The Southern District declined to adopt the Ninth Circuit server rule, which uh, says that it's not infringement because the image remains a third party server and is not fixed in the memory of the infringer's computer. So look for more cases there and we'll follow that circuit split. A case about the Phillies mascot, uh, the Philly fanatic. There are some complicated facts in this case because it has to do with works made for hire and termination rights, where when you have assigned a copyright, you can terminate your assignment of that copyright after 35 years. Uh, typically, there are some other complications, but you cannot assign your copyright uh, if, uh, or you cannot terminate your assignment if it was a work made for hire. Uh, and then also after that termination of the assignment of the copyright, the, the person who had received the copyright can also continue to use their derivative works. So this case is still ongoing and we're gonna have to follow 
to see whether the Phillies' uh, new version of the Philly Fanatic is properly considered a derivative of the original such that the Phillies can continue to use the new mascot. The mascot, and these are just drawings of it. Um, the mascot you see on the left is the original Philly Fanatic. The mascot that you see, that, that series of three on the right, is the one that the Phillies are claiming as a derivative work that they should be allowed to continue to use even after the termination of rights by the original rights owner. So the last case today, a little Midwest flavor for you. Um, if you know someone from Michigan, they have probably told you where they are by holding up their hand and then pointing to where on their hand they are from. Uh, so this has to do with the idea of a thin copyright. You know, you might have a great idea for something but if it's something that's commonly known, you might only be able to get really thin copyright protection. Here, the plaintiff's work was used on clothing and novelty goods. The defendant used its work in connection with stickers and insurance services. And as you can see, both designs involve the outlines of a hand that are kind of positioned to look like Michigan, which is, as I said, a common thing that people from Michigan might do. Uh, and there wasn't a trademark claim here, by the way, because the services and goods were, were so different. Uh, but on the on the copyright side, the court said, yeah, there's only thin protection here. There's no copyright infringement because, you know, you can't really protect the idea of two hands and the hands are not identical. You can see small differences, you know, one as the, the finger kind of folded back. Um, and so they're not actually identical and therefore there was no copyright infringement. So we have a minute for questions, but I don't see any questions in our Q&A. We'll at least bring Alan back on screen so you can see the both of us. Well, if there are no questions, we'll give people, I guess, uh, three minutes of their, uh, of their day back. So, um, I yep, I can close you out with our with our script there. Thank you for joining us today. We hope the information was helpful to you and your organization. As a reminder, this program has been approved for legal education credit and to report your hours, click on the CEU button at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, please be sure to complete our short survey. We plan to use your feedback to plan some future programs that are applicable to you and your business needs. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you.